Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Joe Robertson, and I'd like to speak to you about a type of repair for the condition of atresia and microtia, which allows us to reconstruct the ear canal and the outer ear in a single setting. This is a surgical procedure that we pioneered uh, in our offices in California at the CEI Medical Group. We've worked with Dr. John Reinish and Dr. also Dr. Yosef Tahiri, who you'll hear in just a moment at the end of this talk, uh, to perform these surgeries um, in our office. It's an outpatient procedure, as you'll see, and offers a unique uh, opportunity, especially for families who come to us from a distance, to achieve the goals you're trying to uh, get to in a single day. This surgery is, as I mentioned, a single stage surgery where we perform the work of the ear canal, and that is both opening of the ear canal, creation of an eardrum, mobilization of the middle ear bone, sometimes reconstruction of those, lining of that canal with skin, and then reconstruction of the outer ear as well. Uh, the surgeons work together. Uh, it takes us uh, a, a while to do that. It's about six or seven hours. Uh, patients uh, typically are the first case in the morning and we're done in the mid-afternoon. And patients are able to go home the same day. We first did this surgery in January of 2008 and since then have performed it in over 450 patients. As you might imagine, it's very popular and uh, patients from all over the world. In fact, um, over 65 countries now have had this procedure with us. The age range where we perform the surgery is uh, three years of age and 15 kilograms. Occasionally we can do that uh, a little less than 15 kilograms, but that's our preferred age is about three years of age. That takes advantage of the uh, time uh, the, where the brain is the most susceptible to development with this new sound, with the sound coming from the ear. Um, and by the way, if you haven't seen it, there's an, another talk that I've given about atresia, uh, another talk about auditory development, and those to get a complete picture of this process are something you should take a few minutes and listen to, and they're available uh, to you if you've not heard those already. Um, this is what we, we shoot for. We want three years, excuse me, three months after surgery to have a normal lifestyle and normal hearing. That means you can shower, you can swim, you can play any sports, and to have an ear that is very close to a normal ear. And when we do this right, what happens is when you see a child, the malformation of the outer ear, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't draw your eye. In other words, you just look right over the top of it and nobody notices that anything is amiss. Having surgery this early has some distinct advantages um, for children psychologically. Um, in fact, interestingly, what I've seen is that children who have the surgery early, the combined surgery, when we see them back in two or three or four or five years, they will always refer to it as my ear. Whereas if we do surgery in a child later, say seven, eight, or nine years of age, they'll say that it's my reconstructed ear. Most of the time, three-year-olds don't really remember the surgery very much, which is uh, just fine. And uh, we go right on and that, uh, that segment of their life can uh, go into the distance. Now, this uh, has to be done very carefully. It's a, a multi-stage procedure. Um, it is uh, one that we were very intent upon performing safely more than anything else. And also, we did not want to suffer any uh, reduction in our excellent results by combining these two. So we've started and we've maintained a group of anesthesiologists, pediatric anesthesiologists, who will put these children to sleep. Um, here in California, I work with, oh, well, several hundred anesthesiologists, but there are three three that I have handpicked to do this surgery with us, and they do that each time. Um, a three-year-old with a six or seven hour anesthesia um, is something that needs to be done correctly, and uh, they are really phenomenal. I, I hope to introduce you to them at some point. We also realized that we needed a dedicated operating room. And let me describe that to you. If you go to the operating theater in your local hospital or in the surgery center locally, you might see a gallbladder surgery followed by a knee surgery followed by an ear surgery. And each of those surgeries takes different sutures, different equipment. Uh, some have microscopes, some don't. Some use endoscopes, some don't. So the, the amount of uh, sequence and steps and equipment is dizzying. And the staff, no matter how hard they try, they never get as good as a dedicated team that do the same surgery day after day after day after day. And we decided after doing a number of these that we needed to put together an operating room dedicated for that purpose, which is what we have. We have it in our offices here um, and 
all of our all of these surgeries uh, are done with that team, except a few for insurance purposes that are done in uh, in a different facility. Uh, that is uh, has worked very well. Uh, patients come in the morning, typically about six o'clock, and they're home uh, by late afternoon, uh, awake, alert, and uh, doing quite well. Now, um, these are two young boys. Um, both of them were adopted from China. Both of them had bilateral uh, atresia microtia. And I put this on here because this is a, a fantastic surgery. So, so for these young men, they had four surgeries. Um, instead of, uh, for example, if you separate those, that would turn into eight. And if you selected the rib graft technique, uh, which we can't combine with the canal at the same time, then, then you're talking about 12 surgeries. So um, when you have a child that you have bilateral it's wonderful for. I personally think it's also wonder, wonderful for uh, children that have unilateral uh, disease from uh, a distance. But the results of this are so good um, between you and me. The, the thing that I would want for my own child um, is to have a single stage, a CAM surgery for reconstruction. And uh, by the way, this is Haley, who is my youngest daughter who works with us as well um, with these two young men who are now living <clears throat> in North Carolina, um, but uh, were born in China. We still use the same grading system, uh, the HERE maps, um, and that's uh, more uh, detailed or is explained in the other lecture, so I won't go through that again. But what we will do is we look at all of the factors in evaluation that will help us to determine whether or not a child is a good candidate. Um, in other words, give us a chance uh, to say to you, here's the chance that we will have success. Not everyone is a candidate for this surgery, and usually the thing that keeps them from it is the CT score, the A, as you see, the atresia score. So in all situations, um, I need a hearing test, and I need a CT scan, and I will not book a surgery or proceed with treatment unless I personally look at that scan um, because I've seen so many, I need to evaluate that to see if we can make a canal and, uh, and give that a score. The canal candidacy is based on a score we use from one to 10. Um, those are based on different anatomic characteristics in the CT scan and the, the uh, cliff notes or the, the quick notes here are that if you have a patient who has a score of 6 to 10, then we recommend an ear canal. 5 is on the borderline. Sometimes we'll do that. Uh, but if it's less than 5, typically we will go a different way for hearing. In those ways with implantable hearing devices, for example, are detailed in the other lecture. There are still two situations where we need to do urgent work. One is if there is a tumor that has formed where the ear canal should have been. That's not a malignant tumor, but it slowly grows and can erode into the bone and become infected and can be life-threatening. Um, it's also still possible to get an infection in an atresia ear. And if we see that, particularly with a facial paralysis, which means the infection in the middle ear is out of control and starting to damage the nerve, the facial nerve that runs through the middle ear that controls the face on that side. If we see a, an urgent uh, change there, then that can prompt us to do an emergency surgery. Um, we have seen when we look at our results that the short-term results are almost identical. And when, and when I say identical, I mean I'm comparing the separate procedures to the combined procedure. And the complication rates are uh, also identical in those short uh, those short term uh, uh, looks, that six month look. Now, what we have seen as a difference is that, and this is getting more obvious as time goes by, is that when we perform the combined surgery, there's less of a problem with the ear moving downward over time. And the what happens is when we put the ear around the canal itself, um, over time with gravity, the ear can slide down and it can actually even get to the point where the canal becomes partially blocked. It can cause infections or debris, or it can actually block hearing in that, that area. Now, the reason for that is that when we perform the combined surgery, I'm able to preserve a piece of tissue called periosteum that's against the bone. Periosteum is very tough. And what we do is make a sling that we sew around the implant, the porous polyethylene implant, and it suspends it so it keeps it from moving down. 
Once we've done the ear canal surgery, that tissue is no longer available. And we begin, we've begin we got to see a higher revision rate among people that have separate surgery. So that is really about the only difference between the two of them. Now, we do need, in some patients, the prosthesis like we would need if the middle ear bones are not uh, good, uh, which we will see, uh, we get a good look or a, a suspicion, I should say, on a CT scan, but we never know 100% until I actually see the middle ear bones. In, uh, in the operating room under the microscope. Now, we also have not seen um, an increase in infection rate, which is great. That seems to be the same. Infection, when it occurs, is usually the outer ear. It's rare for the, for the ear canal to be a problem. So this is a graph that shows us um, our hearing results between the two because I did not want to uh, decrease our, our results. And as you see, they're almost identical. There's three things that are compared here. One is doing the ear canal alone. In other words, there's a normal outer ear, but no ear canal. So our average there is 29. And then uh, the second category is a canal first and then the med pour. And as you may remember from other lectures, the, dis the, the time frame between a canal and then the med pour is about six months. And then the last uh, blue bar diagram at the bottom is the combined atresia uh, microtia uh, repair, which is 28. So this is published in uh, Otology, Neurotology, and September 2009, if you uh, want to pull that paper and read more extensively about that. Um, so uh, that uh, is a, a family here who had bilateral. They're from Russia. Uh, he's had his first ear surgery, um, and he's back for his second one. And uh, you see here that this is the ear we're getting ready to operate on, his left side. His right side looked exactly like that before. Um, and then uh, this is the ear um, which we have completed. Now, you also may notice that the, the nice thing about this is that he is not wearing any sort of bone conduction device. So what we see is that when patients get their first ear performed, many times they will stop uh, asking for hearing device. Other times they'll still use it off and on or in more difficult situations. But our goal, what, by the time we get the second ear done, is to be uh, finished with any sort of external hearing device. And we're able to do that a high percentage of the time. So um, all of us want the same thing. We want the outer ear to look as normal and as beautiful as possible. We want the ear canals to be free of trouble and to provide normal hearing and for children to be without their devices. So that's a, a wonderful thing which we uh, can usually accomplish for them. Uh, now let me show you uh, for just a minute what we're coming up with here. Um, this is the view from a new office building that we will uh, occupy in January 1st of 2021. Uh, it's, I know it's hard to believe in the Bay Area there's actually any open land, but there's, there is a beautiful open space preserve and this is the view out the front door. Uh, here's the office in construction. Uh, it will be ready here in the, in the late part of 2020. Beautiful redwood groves around it, and we've constructed a state-of-the-art operating room um, for the, um, the patients who come uh, to see us there. And uh, in this time of COVID, I actually like this uh, quite a bit because we're isolated by ourselves. We're only a few miles from the hospital if we need anything, which we don't plan on, but always good to be prepared. Um, and uh, this is dedicated just to treatment of these patients. I'll give you a couple more resources, and then we're going to turn this over to Dr. Tahiri. This is our website, atresiarepair.com, uh, and there is a, a wealth of information there about this procedure. Uh, this uh, talk, for example, will be reposited there. And if you have uh, a family member who's not able to make it where you are now, or you want to share that with someone, that's a good way uh, for them to see that as well. Uh, again, atresiarepair.com is the website. We also have, uh, my wife and I have, have a home uh, that we've purchased that has a space. There are actually two homes together, space for four families. Um, and we have uh, constructed that in a way where there's a playroom. We call it the post-op playroom, which means it doesn't have a trampoline or it doesn't have uh, uh, hammers that kids can whack each other with. They're soft and easy toys to play with. It's in a quiet neighborhood that's close to the office. And if that helps you to be able to uh, park your family there for the month that you need to stay with us, then that is uh, usually available to you. And we offer that at a much reduced price, probably I'd say a third of what most places are around here. So let us know regarding that one. So here are contact information before uh, we turn this over to Dr. Tahiri. Email at the top if you want to grab a picture of that. Uh, there's our Instagram feed if you like to see that. There are a large number of patients uh, around the time of surgery, after surgery, and other things that you can take a look at uh, that. And then there's a Facebook page as well. So thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I will turn this over now to Dr. Tahiri. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Oberson. 
So the advantages of the combined atresial microtia surgery, the one big one is the single trip to the US with a single surgery for your child. That means until we have only one period of healing versus two period, which is the canal first and then the ear reconstruction. So psychologically, it is better uh, for the child. As I said, there's also one period of four months uh, of molding versus the two uh, four month periods of molding, which is also easier on the child and the parent. And finally, because it's only one trip to the US, you have a lower cost. Other advantages inherent to the surgery is we became much better at reconstructing a tragus. Uh, since Dr. Robertson and myself are working um, together uh, to create a larger and more natural tragus. We also have less chance of stenosis um, and less chance for the implant to move down over the canal. Uh, and this is because of our collaboration. Um, we create a, a periosteal leash or flap that helps and hold the, the ear up. And thus there's less chance for the prosthesis to slip down and cause narrowing of the canal. The ear and the canal are better aligned. The, the two main disadvantages is a slightly longer surgery and really is slightly longer and I mean 30 minutes to an hour at best. Um, but I really think the main disadvantage is that it's a very popular surgery and we have a limited amount of dates available to do those surgeries since I have to fly from Los Angeles to Palo Alto uh, so that we can do the surgery together. Uh, so it's very popular, so it's hard to get a slot. This is an example of a patient after sur before the surgery, and this is after the surgery. Uh, we mark the vessels for the flap to reconstruct the ear. And this is after the implant is put in. You can see the trigger reconstruction. There's a little sponge uh, in the canal. And you can appreciate the projection of the ear. These are other markings preoperatively. This is what, again, it looks like right after the surgery. And you can see how we focus on creating a nice tragus. This is what it looks like after uh, four weeks. You can see there is great definition, great projection. The, the child is not traumatized, is happy. And this is after a few months. And this is an example of a, a patient of ours uh, who uh, went back to school a few months later, very pleased. In terms of differences between the combined surgery and the separate surgery, there are no differences in terms of hearing result. We have really, uh, the, the hearing uh, is really good either way. Um, we have less stenosis with the combined surgery versus the separate surgery. The, the chances of vessel injury or flap injury are similar. And the infection rate, which is less than 2%, is the same. So how do you decide uh, if your child would benefit from a combined surgery versus uh, a, um, a separate surgery? It depends on the personality of your child. Some, some children are better with one surgery and you may want to get a combined surgery. Also, it depends on the findings of the CT scan. In rare instances, a patient can have a cholesteatoma. If a patient has a small or medium-sized cholesteatoma, Dr. Roberson can take care of the cholesteatoma and do the canal at the same time as the combined atresia microtia surgery. However, if we find a large cholesteatoma on the CT scan, Dr. Robertson may opt to do the cholesteatoma removal first and then thus do a separate surgery. I think it is very important to discuss hearing here, and I don't think that needing a combined surgery and waiting for it um, should take precedence over restoring hearing. Hearing sh is very important and should be restored as early as possible and as advised by Dr. Roberson. So if let's say the timing to get the combined surgery is too long, it may be better to do separate surgery because we want to restore hearing for the patients um, and because it will help with speech. Um, the wait time now is approximately uh, six months with added capacity. Thank you very much.